Good evening, everyone. My name is Tim Schmidt. I'm the president and founder of the United States Concealed Carry Association, the USCCA. And uh, welcome to tonight's special broadcast. Uh, the title is Freedom and Safety in the Face of the Coronavirus Threat. Um, I'm excited to be here tonight. I've got a very special guest. Colion Noir is a Second Amendment activist. He is a, a, folk, a person that I'm sure you guys have seen uh, all over the internet. He makes fantastic videos, but most importantly, he believes in the natural born right to self-defense. And that's why I invited him on tonight. So welcome, Colion. Thanks for having me, Tim. How's it going? It's going great. It's going great. I've, I've, I've got a, a nice little list of, uh, of, of, of exciting things we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so okay. before, we di before we dive in, here, here's what we're going to be talking about. First, we're going to discuss um, self-reliance and preparedness. I know a lot of people right now are, are concerned about, about their Second Amendment rights, but not only that, but their own personal safety. And uh, so that's going to be the first topic. Okay. Next topic we're going to be talking about is, is why is there the, this, this, this perception or, or reality that so many of our politicians want to take our guns away? And we're seeing this over and over in, in more and more news stories. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, the next one, this topic is, is a little controversial, um, but it, it, it was mentioned over and over in the hundreds of questions that were submitted uh, for, for this broadcast tonight, and that is, let's talk about martial law and what that really means. Now, I realize to some of you that may seem, holy cow, that's crazy, mm -hmm. but, but, but trust me, I, I know that a lot of our viewers are thinking about it. Yeah. Next, we're going to be talking about um, home, defense, home defense and personal defense recommendations. And so uh, you and I are going to have a discussion on what are our own personal home defense and personal defense, uh, you know, weapon systems and, 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 and you know, what, what we like and what we don't like. Uh, yeah. And then we're going to talk about first time gun owners. And then we're going to wrap things up with this whole concept of, of information overload. Now, if you're anything like me, I mean, I, I pretty much have Fox News on 24 uh, seven, as well as a, a bunch of other websites. And, 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 you know, there's, there's just almost too much information. And so we're going to talk about that as well. Um, for those of you, and I realize that Coleone has a gigantic following. And so I'm sure a lot of you guys are watching this right now thinking, who the heck is this Tim Schmidt? What's the USCCA all about? So the USCCA, we're all about education, training, and legal protection for responsible American gun owners. And so our hundreds, if, actually we have almost 400,000 members all across the country. And these are the most responsible gun owners that exist. And, uh, and we're all about creating new responsible gun owners. Um, toward the end of this thing, I'm just going to plant a little seed here, but we're going to have a couple special offers, uh, a special offer for current USCCA members who are watching this, as well as for those of you who have never even heard of the USCCA, we're going to give, give you a great opportunity uh, to, to become a member and, and save a ton of money and really... Uh, make your uh, self-defense training go as fast as possible. So, with that being said, let's dive into this thing. And the first topic, Coleone, is going to be self-reliance and preparedness. Um, let me just tee this up. So, I, okay. I, personally, I personally believe that, that one of the, like, the, the core values of being an American is self-reliance. I mean, most people, as Americans, feel that, hey, I'm self-reliant. Now, the key word there is most, because unfortunately, there are a bunch of people that are looking to the government to, to, to take care of them, but uh, that's certainly not you or me. And so I, no, would, just no. love, I would love to hear your perspective on, on self-reliance and, and, and how that impacts on, on what you're doing right now. Well, you know, for me, it, it stems from largely by the, by the way I was, I was raised. Um, you know, I was raised by a mother who kind of always taught me that you know, at the end of the day, like I grew up with, like as a young kid, I, when I was younger, I wanted to be a basketball player. Um, I had this idea that I was going to the NBA and, you know, and I worked <laughs> my ass off. I really did. Like I, I did everything I could possibly do right. But nature wasn't in the cars for me. It is. It's just it's not happening. <laughs> so, and, and, and the whole time my mom always, you know, she always tell me she was like, you know, you know, basketball is fine, but focus on your education because they can take everything away from you, but they can't take away this. That's, that's, mm. I grew up hearing that all the time. And what that taught me was is that you you've always need to position yourself in such a way that you, you can do something for yourself where you don't have to depend on somebody else to do it for you. Mm. It's great to have help. Take the help when you can get it for the most part. 
but to rely on it and to depend on it wholly is just a mistake. And that's that's just the way that I was I, I was raised. So for me, I never really looked at the I never looked to the idea of the government's going to protect me. Even when I was even when I was younger, I remember hearing about the concept of social security. And I was like, I don't have a lot of faith in that. So, and this, this is before I could even form, really, really have an idea about what my political stances were and so forth and so on. But in my mind, I was like, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't really think that I'm going to depend on that. Um, so a part of it too could just be just my natural personality is to be able to do for myself the best that I can. Um, and so that that kind of permeated into everything else as far as my, my political views, um, you know, my personal dealings, so forth and so on. And anyone who knows me personally knows that I'm, I'm I tend to be a little bit of a solitary creature and, um, mm. you know, I tend to depend on my abilities. And but I'm not so arrogant or so dumb to think that, you know, there are people who know more about certain things than I would. And so I would that's I would defer to that expertise whenever necessary. But but at the end of the day, it's to acquire information from that person in such a way that I can take it and utilize it myself. Um, if I can't do it, I just absolutely can't do it for myself. Then it's left to me to figure out a way to leverage someone or something else to do it. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, it all comes back to depending on myself for the most part. But then, you know, awesome. within realistic parameters, of course. Sure. Sure. I, I think that's a perfect embodiment of, of what being an American is is doing whatever it takes to, to, to take care of yourself. My, my father, my late father, always used to say to me, Tim, if it is to be, it's up to me. Meaning that don't, don't rely on anyone else. You, you, you know, if, if you want something, you've got to go out there and do it. And uh, those, those words from my dad, they, they resonate in my head all, all the time. So with respect to that self-reliance, so, so just today I, I, I read a... Um, uh, a Dallas police, uh, or no, the Dallas police no longer respond to car break-ins, vandalism, or shoplifting. Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, so, so talk about self-reliance. Essentially what they're yeah. saying, and this is no knock on police officers, that's one of the toughest jobs that there is. I have lots of, 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 of friends that are cops, and I have nothing but respect for them. But if you're living in Dallas, you better be able to protect yourself, because the, the, the cops are, are busy doing other stuff. I mean, what, what, I live in Dallas. So I, I, I know all too well about the things that go on in Dallas. And I live in the heart of Dallas. I live in, uh, in the exact county where they said this. And <laughs> let's just say I have a Ring doorbell app. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, this is going to sound bad, but the level and amount of entertainment you can get just watching the different stories and the, the posts that people make on that app within your area is, is insane. But one thing that really does bring to light is how much crime actually happens in your area that you mm. never see or hear about until you actively partake in looking to see what happens. And wow. for me, when I heard them say that, it wasn't like, oh my God, what is wrong with the police? They don't care. That wasn't my mindset. That wasn't my, mental, my mentality. I understood why they were doing it from a logistical standpoint. However, um, I... I kind of question why they would make a public statement about it. <laughs> um, you know, to me, left, left, left to me, I would say, okay, just whatever calls you got, just say, look, we're not sending anybody out here. We're going to direct you to a place where you can make a report and we'll get back to it. Um, wow. I, what I feared was the emboldening. Um, I, have, I have a couple of friends who know people in the area who have been victims of the uptick in crimes in the area. Um, people breaking mm. in the cars and broad daylight and so forth and so on. And then just reading a lot of stuff that I'm seeing, like I read, uh, had someone send me a post uh, a couple of days ago about a girl who was literally leaving a friend's house. I think it was around 8 p.m. And car rolls up, three guys hop out with guns and rob her of all of her stuff in an mm. area in Dallas that was very affluent. So the idea that we can wholly depend, wholly depend on the police for our safety um, I, I think it's silly. I think it's a, it's a bit juvenile, and that's and again, that's not a knock on on, on the police. They mm -hmm. they are consistent of humans, so they're inherently lim limited. So they can only do so much, even at full force, even notwithstanding them dealing with a pandemic. They mm -hmm. they're still limited. Um, Dallas is notoriously known for for having a pretty stretched thin police department. So from that perspective, uh, you know, I heard it and I was like, huh, well, there we go. Um, what what else would I need to hear as a criminal to be more emboldened by the fact that, you know what, I can get away. Not only can I get away with doing this, what I'm going to assume is, well, they might not be telling the, the complete story. Maybe they can't read a lot of things. So mm -hmm. I was already going to do it before the pandemic. 
So why not do it now when I'm more likely to get away with it? And so I'm just more yeah. worried about incentivizing other criminals to do things that they normally maybe wouldn't have done. And um, but withstanding that, I mean, I, I I don't think to call the cops anyway, because, you know, for me, I look at any situation I may find myself in is how do I get myself out of this situation? And then I will think then I will call the cops after the situation is done if I'm in a position to do so. Yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the powerful things about, about police force is that, you know, just like responsibly armed citizens, um, you know, the police presence provides a powerful deterrent effect, right? I mean, mm -hmm. when, when, that, that, that's why police officers wear uniforms. That's why they drive marked cars, because people yep. can see them like, oh, okay, we're safe here. And, and the bad guys see them and they're like, oh, crap, you know, the cops are here. And so to go out and say, oh, by the way, you know, we're no longer going to be you know, pro or, you know, going after these criminals, I couldn't agree more with you about the emboldening of, of the criminals. So then let's layer on top of that the fact that, 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 that now there's, there's certain counties and certain states that are claiming that, that gun stores are, are, shouldn't be open. That, yeah. you know, they're, they're not, they're, they're not uh, what, what's the word that, that they're looking for? Um, they're they're, 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 yeah, they're non-essential businesses. I mean, that, that's, that's absolutely crazy. To, to us, it is because we rely on it. You know, that, yeah. that is the source of our, that is the source. Theoretically, that's the source of our protection, right? Because we go to gun stores to get guns. Yeah, you can get guns by other means as well. But by and large, that's how the vast majority of people get their firearms. And if we have a Second Amendment in this country and we don't, the Second Amendment means nothing if we don't have actual access to the tool <laughs> that, the, <laughs> that the amendment protects us having. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they think they're slick and they think they're smart in a lot of ways. And, you know, they do things like, create bullet taxes or try to ban certain bullets and things of that nature. It's like, here you can have the car, but you don't get any gas, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, you know, when I see that, all it does is it reinforces and reminds me, these politicians don't really largely care about the right for you. Um, and in, some of it is, is, is nefarious. Some of it is just pure apathy because they are essentially in an, in an elite, in an elite class. Um, they have access to resources and things that you normal people don't have. So there's almost a sort of disconnect and, and they look at it's like, who needs gun stores and, and, and whatever, hold them down. Right. <clears throat> or yeah. if you live in a particular state where inherently they are anti-gun, oh my God, this is a blessing. It's like, oh God, we've been wanting, looking for a way to do this for the longest time, finally. Shut it down, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, I'm thinking about it because they, they don't care about your right to own a firearm. So yeah. to, to them, of course, it's not essential because they don't care. They don't want you to have it in the first place. So they're not going to think the place where you go to get it is an essential business. Um, so they'll yeah. shut it down without blinking an eye. But for us, yeah. I think I think there is I think it's incredibly messed up because what we're talking about here is you can't tell me we're dealing with a global pandemic, something we've never really dealt with before on global scale, and then tell me that we're not really quite sure how we're gonna deal with this. And then tell me, we need you to shelter in place for an extended period of time. And then tell me, as a result of requiring you to shelter in place, we've pretty much shut down our economy. And then tell me, there are a lot of people who are out of work and probably are not gonna be able to pay their bill. What do you think is going to possibly happen? Like, right. like, you can't tell me all of that and then say, oh, and by the way, you don't get to go to the store to go buy a gun to protect yourself in the event we do have a societal collapse. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, that's and, messed up. <laughs> and, and, and the police probably won't be responding anytime soon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, so, guy, like, like, so, so let's layer this one, one, one more thing on top of that or maybe kind of slide it in there. And that is that. I bet you that of these, you know, millions and millions of brand new gun owners, I think I read that over 5 million NICS checks or background checks happened in January and February, 5 million yep. just in two months. I got to think that a ton of these people are people that probably in the past were anti-gun only because they never thought it through or never really thought through the, the whole concept of personal protection. But now they're in this mm. awkward position of they just bought a gun. They know nothing about it. And, yeah. and uh, I, I wonder how, how, that's, how that's changing their perspective. You know, I think like, there are, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of dumb people in the world. However, um, I, I think people <laughs> are not so dumb <laughs> as to understand the carnal nature of people, right? Mm -hmm. It's just some people need to be closer to it to really accept it. 
whereas others understand it inherently and thus prepare for the possibility of having to deal with it. And, mm -hmm. and that's just a long, fancy way of saying, sometimes you need to be close to get hit on the head before you realize, oh, damn, I need some protection. Mm -hmm. And so I think what a, lot of, <laughs> what a lot of people are seeing now, it's just, they're just like, wait a minute, it's finally clicking. It's like, so we're, they're watching their government pretty much kind of scramble to figure out how to deal with this pandemic. And then at the same time, tell them that like, you know, things may get a little weird. And then wh what do you expect these people to do? They're gonna, they're gonna go looking for a way to maintain their sense of safety because it's, it's, it was largely dependent on something that is now showing vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they feel like, well, I, I, can't, I can't trust that. I thought you would do a better job than I could protecting myself, but guess what? I'm looking at a situation now, and then the, be the thing, a beautiful thing, I guess you could say, we have this wide availability of information now. So we have all of the videos and all of the articles that have talked about societal collapse before and what happened. You can talk about the LA riots and, and, uh, and other instances where people, the, the Katrinas and all of those things, where you can see that people were largely left to their own devices. Yeah. And so you take that and you couple that with this inherent insecurity of their dependence, uh, their in, the inability of their particular government to protect them. Any imbecile is going to think, I mean, I like it, but I think I need to get a gun. It honestly doesn't surprise me in the slightest bit. Now I do find yeah. the hypocrisy quite comical, you know, and then there's a, there's a weird dichotomy within me that goes, Oh man, I want to rip it to y'all so bad. We've been telling y'all this for so long and now you're finally just doing it. Right. But then at yeah. the same time, I, you know, I think to myself, I say, well, you know, I was, a, I was that, I was that guy at some point. Right? Mm. I just fucked up that I, I fell into my firearm journey a lot uh, when it, when there wasn't a pandemic. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so for me, it's, you know, I look at it and say, all right, so now that we've gotten past this point, now what do we do to teach them? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and the beautiful thing is, and now I got a series of videos where I'm going to be coming out talking about those things. And I'm pretty sure we're going to get into some of the resources that that you can get through USCCA as well. That does think mm -hmm. in an acceptable way. Um, how do we how do we groom these people to then go from gun owner to advocate? <clears throat> right. right. Because the more oh, people we exactly. Advocate, you know, right. yeah. and, and so, and that's, so that's kind of my, my mindset right now. Yeah, I, I honestly, I think this is an amazing opportunity for, for, for really the entire 2A community and for people like you and me. And he, here's why I think that, Colleen. So last Thursday, I talked to my whole company about, hey, guys, we're going virtual. We're, you know, you're working from home. We're going to make this happen. It's going to be challenging, but we can yeah. do it. We can get through this. And just not to pat my company on the back too much, but they've done a great job. And I'm so proud of, of, of everyone there. It's um, awesome. But I, but I did say to him, I said, guys, you know, you may not believe this, but there's going to be a silver lining to what we're going through right now. There's going to be maybe even more than one. And I think an amazing silver lining for, for really the, the, the voice of freedom in our country is that all these folks have had their eyes open to the fact that firearms ownership is not about duck hunting. It's yeah. not about deer <laughs> hunting. No, it's about yep. protecting your family and your loved ones. And, and, and to, what, to the point you just made, Colleen, is that, yes, now we have a huge responsibility to help all these new gun owners, all these new people, to be responsible gun owners and understand you know, how to handle their weapon, how to safely store their weapon, what to do before, during, and after a violent encounter. And, and yeah. trust me, wh when we take them down that path, then they become advocates because they realize this is this is actually great. Yeah, this is yeah. something I I never knew about. So I mean, I, it's something I, that, that, that. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Oh no! It's um, it's, it's firearm ownership is something that permeates the entirety of your life, whether you want it to or not, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, because it, it it's the most symbolic and physical representation of self reliance and independence that you could possibly have, um, mm -hmm. notwithstanding maybe a car. But even then, I beg to differ. So. What that does is you start applying, and this is coming, I'm saying this because this is what happened to me. You start applying these aspects of what you're learning from the firearm standpoint, you apply them to other aspects of your life. You do change as a person. And I do believe you change for the better whenever you have the requisite knowledge. Whenever you have somebody guiding you down that road in the proper manner, I do think you change for the better as a person. Um, it's just a lot of people just need people to kind of guide them and just, just gently nudge them in the right direction. Um, and, and, yeah. and I think from there, what we end up doing is we start creating even better citizens. 
We start mm. creating even more patriotic citizens. We start creating more people who have a love for the country because when they get to the fundamental understanding of what the country was based on, forget forget the mistakes that a lot of the very human people who who were part of the making of this country made. Just take just the ideologies and the principles, the, the the inherent purity of them. I said the same thing when I um when I was on uh, with Bill Maher when he, he questioned me about the idea that I was a black guy. You know, at a point in this, in this country's history, I wouldn't have been able to own a firearm. And I was like, yeah, you're right. But because of the purity of the language of the document that created this country, I stand before you now as a gun advocate. So it's, a, it's like that, that's, that's the inherent beauty of it. And then I think when people, the more people start to own firearms and then start to understand the principles behind them, because that's just as important as the ownership of the firearm, we start creating better citizens in this country. And I'm telling you what, you have a citizenry that is as armed as we are, who have the pride in the country that we live in, no one could touch us. No one. A Amen. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Fa fantastic. Okay. So I pre I'm pretty sure you and I could talk about this topic for at least four to five yeah. hours straight. So uh, let, let's just move on to the next one. Otherwise, yeah, our yeah, viewers absolutely. are going to be like, hey, what's going on? Now, <laughs> I, I know that this next topic to some may sound a little bit strange, uh, but man, based on the hundreds of questions that came in, I bet you at least 50% of the questions people were worried about what happens if, if, you know, if, if martial law is declared. And so when I first heard that, I'm like, oh, I, I don't know. So I did a little research and let me just tee this up. I'm going to read from Article 1, Section 9 of our U.S. Constitution states mm -hmm. the privilege of the the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. So from that perspective, I mean, I, by, by, I, mean I, I know you're a lawyer. I'm not even a lawyer. I'm certainly I'm no constitutional <laughs> scholar, but uh, I, I can't imagine the U.S. would be ever be in a point in a situation where we're just fighting a virus where martial law would have to be declared. The last time the U.S. declared martial law was when, uh, I believe it was Pearl Harbor. What are, what are your thoughts on this? Is, is this crazy or what? It is crazy. It's, it's, it's borderline scary to think about. But the crazy thing is this. You know, those words mean nothing without a physical backing, mm -hmm. right? So when I think about martial law and them enacting martial law, and then what can we do to guard against something like that. I can think about a bunch of legal ways to do it, um, but within the moment, those, those legal avenues mean nothing, right, if it's enacted. But there is a caution that you're going to deliberately see by our leaders to actually enforce a, and implement martial law. And the reason for it is our Second Amendment and the fact that we have so many people in this country with firearms. That is always going to be something they factor in and consider. And because of that, there's always going to be a caution with respect to our government in, in the things that they do. Hmm. Trust me, our current government has tried a bunch of nonsense with respect to undermining the Second Amendment, undermining other rights and so forth and so on. But if you notice, they have to engage in a certain level of, of trickery. And the reason hmm. they have to do it, they can't use brute force because we have an armed population of people. And so they have to be cautious because there's no point trying to overtake a group of people if you have to burn it down to do it. And so <laughs> if you invite these people in the wrong manner and then they collectively come together to resist you, you're going to have a problem on your hands that you did not want. And so I think that that right there in and of itself, the Second Amendment provides that level of caution. Because a lot of people are like, well, what are you going to do to little handguns against a, against a tank? It's not about that. It's not about that. Some, it, 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 from the standpoint of, is it worth it? What are the opportunity costs of becoming a tyrannical government? What are they? Are we going to lose an entire country as a result of it because you had a group of people come together and fight back? To the, I mean, think about it. So they're always going to be cautious about the way they go about such levels of tyranny if they mm -hmm. if they have the if they have the desire to do it because of the Second Amendment because we are a non population. Think about this now and say, I don't know China. Think about how they handled the situation there, right? They can do what the government can do whatever they want. And they did, and they do, and they continue to do because the people, don't, the people there don't have the rights that we have here. Our government has to be cautious. They have to, they have no choice. You have mm -hmm. 
300 million people running around with air 15s and handguns right and and, uh-huh. and, I, and, I don't, and i don't mean that in a flippant way in terms of you know it's like we're gonna come after the government but they understand that you cannot rile up the beast and the way you rile up the beast is to infringe on our rights yeah. whether it be the second amendment the first amendment you name it and so there's always going to be a caution there it's still very much very well could happen and i think and, and i think about it too and it does kind of bother me a little bit considering the way things are going from what i'm seeing um so it's definitely something that's on my mind but i am glad that they're always going to have to engage in a level of caution in terms of making that decision because of the way we are in this country and i think that's a beautiful thing because it does essentially inherently keep our government in check maybe not perfectly yeah. but enough yeah yeah that's yeah that's that's well said Coyone. and and um and god help us if we ever allow this country get to get to the point where we're, we're, we're no longer armed, because then they will do whatever they want. And ca- they case, want. In, case in point, like you said, China. Um, so let's think about this, though. So in light of the fact mm-hmm. that, yes, we're not, hopefully not going to be under martial law anytime soon, there are states uh, and, 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 and counties and, and parts of states that, that essentially are forcing gun shops to close. Now, one thing that I've learned from the study of history is that usually when, when uh, a, a populace becomes unarmed, it's not something that happens overnight. It's like boiling a frog. You put that frog in cold water and you slowly turn that water up one degree at a time until that sucker's boiled. And, uh, and, and so, so things like this, you know, and, and it reminds me of the Benjamin Franklin <coughs> qu- right, quote. <laughs> it's okay. That's all right. It reminds me of the Benjamin Franklin quote that, that those who are willing to give up any amount of essential freedom for even the smallest amount or for, 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 a, for the perception of safety will get neither and deserve neither. And so, I, no. man, if you're, if you're watching this right now, I beg you, please be aware of these tiny little infringements that happen slowly and slowly and little bit, little bit by bit, but pretty soon you wake up and you're like, holy crap, what happened to my natural born rights? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's the game they've been playing and that's the game that they do. And it, 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 I call it the kicking me under the table uh, uh, dynamic. You know, you, you know, when you're a little kid in school and you're the bully and they're like kicking you underneath the table, no one sees it. <laughs> and you're kind of dismissing oh, yeah. it and dismissing it, dismissing it. And then finally mm-hmm. you start, you're like, stop. And everybody's looking at you like, wow, you're, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, 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 what's your problem? <laughs> and it's like, he's kicking me under the table. And it's like, no, he's not. Like, he's not doing anything. He's just sitting there peacefully. And he's kicking <laughs> you under the table again. And you're like, ah! And they're like, okay, this guy's crazy. That's what I feel like sometimes when I'm talking about these small encroachments and these little things that they try to do when I make these videos. And people are like, why are you always talking? Why is every little thing you have to fight against? And I'm like, because... You don't understand the game that they're playing. They're these little, yeah. they're just kicking us underneath the table. You don't see it, but we do because we're in it. And trust me, when you <laughs> get in it, like a lot of these gun owners are now, oh, now they're going to see the kicking or feel the kicking. And now hopefully we'll have a team of people saying, stop. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. So earlier today, uh, this afternoon, I, I actually I spent a little time at the range sighting a few rifles mm-hmm. in. And then I'm like, ah, man, I got to, even though I wanted to spend all afternoon there, I had to get yeah. back to my house. Uh, and, and, I, and I went through some of the hundreds of questions that, that all of you viewers uh, sent in. So I, I just want to read some of these questions and, and let's address them. Uh, there, okay. There's some really, actually, the, the first one I'm going to read, it doesn't really need an answer, but it's, it's probably hands down the best question that came in. Uh, this is from Don B, location unknown. Uh, Dear Coleone and Tim, we have illegal alien sanctuary cities, Second Amendment sanctuary cities. Isn't it time to have First Amendment sanctuary cities and maybe Ninth Amendment sanctuary cities, Tenth Amendment sanctuary cities, and even, Trump forbid, Constitution sanctuary cities? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's Don, awesome. Don, Don B., you get, you get the best question award of the day. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's get serious here. So, I mean, this obviously is a serious topic, and, and I, I, hopefully you're watching this, you're not thinking that we're making light of it. If anything, I, 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 I challenge or I, um, I try to inspire my team, my employees, like, hey, guys, you know what? There's nothing wrong with preparing, but, but fear is contagious. 
And, and so the best way to combat fear is to focus on gratitude and optimism. I'm not saying don't prepare. Yes, you should prepare. Do everything you can. But at the same time, you can limit your fear and anxiety by focusing on, on what you're grateful for. So with that being said, here, here's a question from, uh, uh, this is an anonymous question. Okay. Dear Coleon and Tim, what are your self-defense rights if a group of 11 suspected renegades assemble on your porch and are pounding on your door demanding food and supplies? Ooh. Um, Cole- I know Coleon? I would have, but <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'd probably be sitting on my staircase with a rifle. Um, and with the phone in my hand, calling the cops. I, I, I've done, I, I guess you can say I've been in, not in a situation like that, but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm always of the mindset of, uh, I'm, I'm going to not necessarily retreat, but you, you're going you're gonna to have to really push me to that point where I'm like, I really have no other option but, mm-hmm. but to engage you with lethal force. That is my personal stance. Um, I'm not saying everybody needs to be the same way. That's just me. Um, like I, I was in a situation where I had a guy who I don't know what, what happened. I pissed him off somehow. I don't know. I didn't do anything. But he decided that he was going to follow me. He was following me very aggressively. And, and he was really literally trying to catch up to me. And for me, um, what I did was I, I took my gun out and I sat it on. I sat on my lap and I called, uh, I called the police on Bluetooth. And I'm like, look, I'm being followed by someone rather aggressively. Um, they'd made threatening gestures to me. I'm trying to evade. However, if I reach a point where I can't evade, I'm, I'm going to have to do what's necessary to protect myself. Um, they stayed on the phone. I tried to evade. I was able to evade. And, and, that, and that's what happened. In that situation, you're in your house. There's nowhere for you to go. So for me, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a firearm and then try to see if I could get um, ancillary people to come and basically defuse the situation. But at a certain point, your, your back literally is against the wall. You're in your home. And I don't really play with my house. For me, that is my sanctuary. That's where I go for my peace. If I don't have that, I don't have anything. So I don't play with my house. So the moment I sense a threat with respect to my house, my mind automatically goes lethal. It just does. So for yeah. me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hunker down in my house with my firearms, and I'm going to wait. And, and as soon as that barrier is breached, it's going to be a different type of party. Um, I'm probably not going to go actively go out and engage them. But for me personally, that's how I would probably handle it. Um, from a legal standpoint, depending on your state, uh, depending on the country you're living in, some, for some people, um, I know here in Texas they treat your house as your sanctuary. That that that's your dom song. So if your your castle is your castle, and you defend your castle accordingly. Um, so the Texas laws, for at least for me, function the same way that I ha- the uh, coincide line, coincide with my mentality with respect of how I go about protecting my home. Because to me, that is the most important thing. And in many ways, I kind of approach my car as the same way because I'm, I never feel more vulnerable than when I'm in, when I'm in my car. Um, so yeah. I look at those two as like, that's, you don't, you don't, you don't cross those barriers with me. My home is my home. Um, if I don't have that, I have nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, <clears throat> that's really well said. You're certainly in alignment with, with my thinking on that. Um, you know, the, the challenge and you actually just brought it up is that, you know, every state, has very different laws in terms of, uh, yeah. you know, when, when it's okay to use force. Um, and, and so that's a challenge. And one of the things that we do to our members or for our members at the USCCA is we have a very, very deep resource that covers all the, the, the specific uh, rules and regulations for uh, responsible firearm ownership as well as uh, deployment and, and when you can and can't shoot. Um, uh, for all the different states, so so I uh, I'm completely in agreement that hey, if someone's on my on my porch banging down my doors, you know there there's going to be trouble. Yeah. And and this and the and the scary thing is is that you know only two months ago, you and I would never even dream of of, of that being a reality. But but I mean that, that really that could happen. It's fast, it's, man. It's, it's, it's scary. <laughs> it's um, fast. All right, here's another question from a, a viewer. This is from Doug in Pennsylvania. What steps should we take, or what steps should we be taking to make sure we have the resources to protect ourselves during this crisis? Um, Coleon, why don't you let me start on this one? So, so, so Doug, first of all, um, I, I, I have tremendous respect uh, the, uh, for the fact that, that you're thinking about, hey, I need to prepare for this crisis and, and I need to be the first line of defense for my family. That's um, 
good. You know, that's fantastic. Good for you. Uh, I, I would recommend that, that, that you have, you know, make sure that you have at least 30 days of food that, uh, that you can support the, the folks that live in your house. Uh, make sure that you have uh, uh, you know, self-defense equipment so that you can protect your, your house should, should you need to. And, uh, and ultimately, I, I'm a firm believer in, in, in getting together with your neighbors and just that small sh- local community and make sure that you guys are all on the same page with, hey, what cars should be coming in and coming out of our, of our neighborhood? I mean, in general, it's pretty easy to know who your na- what your neighbor's cars are. But in this day and age, it's easy sometimes to, to not really know your neighbors. Well, now is the time to get to know them and, and make sure you're all on the same page and, and, and kind of being your, your neighborhood watch for everyone else and, and, and banding together to, 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 to work on a, on, a, on a good personal protection plan for you, your family, as well as the whole neighborhood. Um, any, anything to add to that, Coleon? Yeah, no, I, I think making it a point to know your neighbors is a good thing because what I've realized, even in my neighborhood, um, I li- I'm, I'm in a county that's blue. So uh, there are a lot of people in the neighborhood who don't necessarily have the same ideolo- ideological beliefs as me, but people mm. tend to put their ideologies aside when it comes to their safety. So there are a lot of people in the neighborhood, there are people in the neighborhood who, who know that I have a lot of guns. They don't necessarily know who I am or what I do, but I've interacted with them, I've engaged with them. And they've come to me and asked me questions about it. Even though I know ideologically, we don't really see eye to eye, but they also understand that in our neighborhood, if something goes if something goes down, all we have are the people in our neighborhood. So they may not like guns, but they're perfectly okay with me and my guns because if something <laughs> were to happen, and since they know me and we've talked and they're like, oh, he's not just this mysterious lunatic over here with a bunch of guns, um, they're perfectly <laughs> fine with it. Um, and so what it does, is it allows me the opportunity to talk to them sometimes and you know, um, open the door a little bit more and a little bit more and then maybe get them to the point where they are on my side of things ideologically. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna have to second everything you said um, and then add that part, just take the time to kind of get to know your immediate neighbors because I think that, that's, a, that's a big deal. And I think having people that close to you as allies is a good thing because you're gonna need them. <laughs> Amen, amen, well said. Here's another question, Coleon. This is from I Josh P. You. Oh, Joe, am I still here? Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Sorry okay, about yeah. that. This is a, a question from Josh P. in Colorado. Uh, okay. Co- Coleon and Tim, should firearms and ammunition sellers be considered essential in- infrastructure and rename and remain open right now? I saw some news about gun stores saying uh, that they should be treated as essential. Um, so, Josh, I. We already talked about this a little bit, but from my perspective, of course, of course, gun stores should be essential. Let me, I, I would challenge the folks that, that or, or the politicians that are saying that, that they shouldn't be essential uh, with, with something like this. Do you think that, that firearm ownership for police officers, officers is essential right now? Well, of course it is. So therefore, if, if it's essential for, for the people that protect everyone else, it should also be essential for the folks that are allowed to protect themselves which is what free Absolutely. people are. Free people get to protect themselves. So Josh, I think we nailed that question for you. Here's, here's one more question and then let's move on to the next topic. This is from uh, just initials DP. Uh, Dear Tim and Colleone, I have family that are first time gun owners because of the crisis. How can I get them informed and trained? <sighs> so about that. I got a video coming. <laughs> no, uh, um, I, I can't think of a better example than the way that I got into firearms. I went to the range for the first time, knew nothing about firearms, and I shot a gun. From there, it was just an explos- explosive exploratory phase into the firearms world where I started just gorging on videos on YouTube. Really, it sounds oversimplistic, but I did. One of the people I was watching pretty regularly was yours truly, Tim. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> So awesome. people underestimate how much of a reference, how, how, much, how much value the internet can give you. It is literally, it's information. That's what mm-hmm. it is. The only thing about it is it's all over the place. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to have to actively seek out and search certain things. Now, one of the beautiful things, um, and I'm going to do a shameless plug here because I, I know that when I was coming up, I had to kind of really kind of piecemeal my information together and we didn't have a lot of the resources online like we do now but like with you uscca it's it's literally an aggregate of all the things i kind of wish i knew growing like growing up as a gun owner in one place 
if, if I just had had that, see you, you were slacking Tim. See, you hadn't had it ready at that time. So I'm blaming you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so for me, I think utilizing those resources as far as the internet, um, actively seeking out things and, and exploring by way of video, by way of articles, um, uh, joining organizations such as USCCA, um, joining other two A uh, advocate uh, organizations as well will go a long way in terms of really informing and teaching you about firearms. Um, and then also take the knowledge that you already have and donate your time. Say, look, mm. sit, take them, sit them down and say, look, I'm glad that you bought this firearm. But most importantly is I, I want to make sure that you're operating it responsibly and safely. And there's a lot of things that come with that. And I just want to kind of make sure that you know those things and then impart the knowledge that you have and give it to them in a lot of ways. And trust me, they'll be incredibly thankful. And you got to remember, though they're though they are now gun owners, they're still going to have a kind of preconceived notion. So if you can have someone who they're close to come in and, and break it down for them, right, that is is a spark that will that will last for eons. Um, and then they'll take that same knowledge and impart it, on, impart it onto someone else and then so forth and so on. So it's like one big pyramid scheme of Second Amendment rights. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> like multi-level marketing for, for 2A. Because um, then they'll go out and tell somebody and they'll go out and teach somebody and that person will go out and teach somebody so forth and so on. So for mm -hmm. me, I think taking, taking your personal time, donating that, and then utilizing the resources that you have on the internet will go miles. Yeah, that's, that, that's such a great point. I, I can remember back in the day when I was first starting out USCCA and, and Delta Defense, and mm -hmm. uh, in, invariably I'd get contacted by, at the time it was just local newspapers, and, and a lot of the times the local newspapers, uh, you know, the writers, they, they were not friendly to the Second Amendment. And uh, so I, I had a challenge to myself. I would always be like, hey, I'll do whatever interview you want me to do, but we're going to do it at the gun range and I'm going to teach you how to shoot a gun. And I would give them like a great experience. You know, at the first I would bring a 22 handgun. And then mm -hmm. if they were comfortable with that, I'd let them shoot a nine millimeter and maybe a 45. And so I'd really try to make it a great experience. And I was surprised at how often these people who, you know, they were, they were fearful of guns. And yeah. because of that fear, they, they just didn't want, they didn't think anyone should have guns, which makes no yeah. sense. Um, but I converted them. It was it was uh, it was it was great. <laughs> yeah, no, it very rarely. I don't think at all. Anytime I've ever taken anyone to the range who was anti, walked away the same level of anti, if at all. Um, yeah. After the fact, so taking people to the range is incredibly important as well. I agree. All right, Colian. So we got about fifteen minutes left. Um, let's okay. talk about. I, I know that quite a few of the viewers right now would love to hear some of our own. Um, personal defense and home defense recommendations. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's try to do it in, in the light of, of kind of what we were talking about before of, of what's in people. You know, people are fear, fearful of, of um, you know, their homes being attacked and yeah. ransacked. And, and let's kind of talk about it from that perspective. So okay. you, why don't you start? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so for me, when it comes to home defense, the most important thing is early alert. Early alert, early alert, early alert. Your guns mean nothing if you don't get to them until someone's standing over you in your bed. It means nothing. Um, so for me is making sure that you remember one to put your alarm system on. Um, that is designed to alert you as it may also be a way of, <clears throat> may be a deterrent for someone trying to break in, but make sure that's always on. Um, so for me, that's the important thing is making sure I always have my alarm on. Um, on top of that, now keep in mind I'm a 36 year old single black male with no kids. <laughs> so uh, my house is, is a proverbial gun resort, right? So I have guns <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> so, um, you know, so in my, in my night, I have a gun sitting on my nightstand ready to go. And I also have a rifle there with a plate carrier. I'm not going, me personally, I'm not going to actively search for you in my house. I'm not, I'm going to wait for you. I'm going to wait for you. To, if I hear someone's in my house, I, if I have the time, I'll don on a plate carrier, grab my rifle, and I'll sit and I'll wait for you. That's just me. Um, if I don't have as much time to put on a plate carrier and, and I have to grab and go, I'll probably grab my handgun. Um, how, and I, I run a suppressor on my, on my rifle, um, and I run 300 blackout. Um, I have a 300 blackout with a, a Leupold, Leupold 1-4 with just a simple red dot. And um, I, run, 
I run suppressors because I don't want to blow my ears out because I'm typically running an SBR anyway. So mm -hmm. that's going to be incredibly loud, notwithstanding me having a can on it. So that's my kind of basic general rundown and setup. I do have a video about it that I did on YouTube if you want to go search it. Um, it's like cool. my nighttime nightstand setup, something like that. Just type in Cole on the War nightstand. Um, okay. And that'll pull up. But for me, um, my go-to home defense is um, a handgun suppressed in 45 and a SBR rifle and uh, suppressed in 300 blackout with supers, not subs. Nice, <clears throat> nice. Um, so, so you said oh, the, the the handgun is a, for, a suppressed 45. Yes. Yeah, I go big. Okay. I go. I go. I go big boys when I'm when when it comes to like home defense because the longest distance in my house I measured it out is I want to say about 14. I want to say about 14 feet. I think. Mm. Um, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 15 yards, sorry, about 15 yards. So the way I see it is I can afford to go big, slow moving rock mm -hmm. in that type sure. of situation. Cause I'm not, I'm not, like, yeah. I'm not really shooting at extended distances. Um, sure. now outside of that, what rolls with me, like, you know, everything goes to crap or whatever. Um, I'm probably going to be, I'm going to be running five, five, six, um, yeah. probably in the SBR of some sort with some variable powered optic, but for home defense, <clears> yeah, I go big. So I go 300 blackout and I go 45 for the handgun. Nice. Um, so I, I love the recommendation on the early warning. That to me, that makes so much sense. Uh, one of the so certain certainly alarm systems are very valuable. Um, mm -hmm. Nowadays, there's so much cool technology. Whether it's like a you know the the, the cameras you put in your house, yeah. the Nest or the Ring, those are su super valuable. Um, personally, my dogs have super solid ears, and they're they're another great early warning system. Uh, but yes, definitely the last. <laughs> Last thing you want to do is is, is having having some uh, crook walking into your bedroom and you're still sleeping. Um, yep. As for specific uh, recommendations on on home defense and personal defense firearms, I, I mean this is another one of those topics that I could I could literally talk about for hours and hours and and a lot of it would be my own uh, subjective opinion. Uh, but but I will say this: so I, I'm a firm believer in ammo caliber minimization. And so if you're going to, if you're going to choose nine millimeter or 45 auto, or even of those two, you know, then just stick, stick with that for handguns. You know, you, the last thing you want is to have seven different handgun calibers and have to screw around with keeping stock of all those different calibers. Um, personally, I used to, I used to carry a 45 auto and, and um, but now I carry a nine millimeter because I went through some simulation training and I couldn't believe how fast I went through my ammunition. Um, so I'm yeah. a big fan of, of nine millimeter. And as for uh, home defense, I think the home defense shotgun is probably one of the best and safest uh, tools for, for defending your home. Um, hopefully that was uh, valuable to the folk, to the person that asked that question. Um, let's see if we have time for one more question. Or no, that wasn't the question. That was our own recommendation. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so, okay, we got a few more minutes left. Let's talk about... We already talked about first-time gun owners and tips and mm -hmm. recommendations. Um, I, I know for a fact, Colleen, that you've got tons of awesome videos on your site um, for first-time gun owners. We have, we have the same thing at uscca.com. There's tremendous amounts of free information. Um, but let's, let's hit this last topic because I think okay. this is something that affects, affects all of us. And, and it goes into that, that cycle of fear that if you're not careful, can, can get away from you. And let's talk about information overload. And, mm. and, and, and I guess, you know, how, what, what do you do to, to keep yourself sane when here we are kind of pretty much locked in our houses and it's so, di so easy to have that TV turned on and listen to Fox News or any news channel, you know, 24-7. What, what do you do? So the funny thing is I get, I get a lot. I get two-way overload, to be honest, um, <laughs> because... Because of what I do, the, 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 the size of my following, I'm bombarded. I can't pick up this phone and not get bombarded with something about the 2A at every moment just because someone's sending me messages, emails, comments, you name it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to turn it off. Mm. Just, just turn it off. <laughs> or actively, for me, it's cars, right? Like a lot, mm. like I've, I've, I've kind of, I've been doing, every once in a while, I'll do like a car review on my channel. Um, and a lot of that, like, you know, some people are like, oh, no, stick to guns. That's not for you. It's for me and my sanity <laughs> because it's, <laughs> it's, it's so much. That is, that's become my outlet to my outlet, right? Because I'll still go to the range and spend hours there. And that's like my getaway and that's my outlet. But my outlet to my outlet are cars. 
And so I'll do something completely n not related to the thing at hand that's that's trying to pull my focus. And um, and I'll just d deep sea dive into that. And then you'll be surprised how, how, how refreshed you feel coming back to what you're doing. And now you're energized. I'm like, all right, let's go. Right. Um, sometimes <laughs> I just have to shut it off because um, I'll hit a wall sometimes. And I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm done. <laughs> and, um, you know, when I take that break and just kind of do something else, right, whether it's get in a car and drive or uh, jump on jump on PlayStation or anything, reading, whatever your whatever your um, whatever your outlet to your outlet is, en engage in that to a degree, because that allows your brain, that part of your brain to recharge. Um, and right now, everyone's kind of being hit the same way that I do with the two way stuff with everything that's going on now. You can't turn on a TV. I can't get on a website. I can't get into an app on my phone without being bombarded with the fact that there is a pandemic going on. And it's just <laughs> like, whew, right? Yeah. And, you know, and then you hear stories and then you have these anecdotal stories and you're like, oh, man, it's, it's killing everybody. And then it, it mm. just it will overwhelm you. And then your your mental will go to shit, <laughs> essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And so you've got to kind of actively disconnect. I'm not saying you need to go full bore hippie and just throw your phone in the garbage and turn everything off and just sit in silence and meditate like you, <laughs> like like you're in a shallow <laughs> temple or something. But just do something different, something that you actually enjoy. Um, yeah. Because because what's the point otherwise? If we still can't do the things that we enjoy, just the little things. Um, for me, I love waking up in the morning and just turning on random YouTube. Like I'm. I'm kind of a little loser geek. So I'll list, I'll turn on like, I'll watch a YouTube videos that have nothing to do with guns. It's just about history or like random engineering stuff. Um, and these like video essays. I love those. And you'd be surprised mm. how much joy they bring to me. Um, things like that. Just do something off the beaten path of what's bombarding you at the moment. And right now, this pandemic is bombarding all of us. So if you can mm. find that escape, whether it is jumping on a YouTube and watching different videos, watching, um, you know, Netflix and <clears throat> chilling, um, all of those things, you know, do it. Do it. Yeah. You need this escape from this escape. I know <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of the way I play it. Yeah, Dude, that, that's aw that's awesome advice. And I think it's so important that that we remember that, uh, you know, the, the news networks, they make money by selling fear, uncertainty and doubt. And so guess yeah. what? When, when you have that thing on all day long, you're just you're, it's just going to be this cycle. And like yeah. I mentioned before, you know, like fear it, it, it is, is contagious and, and, and so is optimism. You can, you can do just the opposite. And I love what you do about, you know, hey, I'm unplugging. I am going to mess around with my cars. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so, absolutely. So, so, hey, let's take a few minutes. I want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about, I, I know that a lot of the, the folks that are watching this right now um, are, are, are your people. They're, they're, your, they're your viewers. And um, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to, to be able to speak with them. I really appreciate you being on, on the show today. And, and you know, I, I was looking at you know, how many YouTube followers we have compared to you. I'm like, wow, I kind of feel weak. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. So, uh, I, I, to be honest, for me, it is, I, I, I had this many followers. And then one day I looked up and I was like, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, that's, that, 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 that only means one thing, and that is that what you're providing is, is very valuable to them, and, and so you should be proud of that. Um, but but as, as for, you know, I know you've been a USDCA member for a while, and, and a lot of people, you know, they ask me, Tim, what, what does the USDCA do? And, and so I say to them, I said, well, imagine you're sitting in your house one night, you're laying in bed, and all of a sudden you hear the crash of the front door, and for some reason, your alarm didn't go off, a dog didn't bark. You open that door, and now here you are face to face with someone breaking into your house and threatening your family. So I ask that question, and, and you know, usually they're, they're like hanging on my every word. Yeah. And, not, and now you're forced to defend yourself, and you shoot this guy who's about to kill you. Now what do you do? And I, and I say, well, that, that's what we do. The USCCA is here to number one, teach you what to do beforehand, what to do during the attack, and ultimately what to do afterwards and to make sure that you don't end up in jail for doing what any one of us would do, which is protect our families. And uh, I mean, honestly, every time I tell that story, you know, that's essentially the USCCA mission and, and it, it gives yeah. me goosebumps because it's an amazing mission. So it's, it's a mission for, for, uh, about saving and changing people's lives. And so I mentioned before at the very beginning of our, of our, of our talk here, Coleon, that, that uh, you asked me to put together a special offer 
for your viewers. Mm -hmm. And so I want, I want to talk about that offer right now. So for all of you folks who, for some reason, are not a USCCA member yet, and if you own a gun for self-defense, I, I want you to really consider this. And I, I, I'm literally going to make this so easy for you because we're literally giving away over $500 worth of free training and, uh, and this really cool Pelican case. I, I'm going to put it on the camera right now. So everyone that joins tonight is going to get this cool Pelican gun vault case. Put all your, your firearms and, and, and equipment in there. Oh, jeez. And then... Uh, You'll also get this. The, you'll also get this USB. It actually looks like a bullet, but it's a USB drive, and this thing has over five hundred dollars of training. That in the past, like a couple years ago, we used to sell this for over five hundred dollars. It's all on there. And you'll get that for free. Some of this training includes home security and home defense, developing a personal protection plan, gun laws, and you how to select a firearm the top 10 concealed carry mistakes and how to avoid them, gun range and gun shop etiquette. There's a whole video, this is all video training on this drive, it goes right into your computer. There's a whole series on uh, what to do if you're attacked in your home, uh, mass shootings, how to survive the worst case scenario, um, protecting, being protected in houses of worship, uh, even the best, the first four issues of, I'm sorry, the first four uh, volumes of Best of Concealed Carry Magazine is on this as well. All you have to do is to go down to uscca.com colon colon noir and uh, there should be probably something on the on the video screen right yeah, here. Go to that, right there, yeah. yeah, go to that URL and uh, and you can take advantage of that offer right now. That's that's courtesy of Colion. He, he he said, hey Tim, if you want me to come on this show, you better give my pe give my viewers a good a good offer, and that's exactly what it is. Now, I also realize, <laughs> <laughs> I also realize there's a bunch of uh, USCCA people on here as well. And so, for those of you who um, who are already loyal USCCA members, thank you for being here. I hope you had, got some value out of this as well. And if you go to uscca.com forward slash member offer, we're actually having discounts of up to 75% on some of our top e-learning courses. I'm talking about. Concealed Carry and Home Defense Fundamentals e-learning, USCCA laser training, and Women's Handgun and Self-Defense Fundamentals. Up to 75% off on these for, for USCCA members only. So, Coleon, I got to tell you, first of all, it, it's great to get to know you better. I've been watching you for years, and uh, I'm so impressed uh, with you. How are you? That's the phrase. That's the crazy thing. Like I literally, like when I first started out, like I was watching your tactic with them videos. I was, I was watching them. I love it. So here we are. It's crazy how the world works. That's super cool. That's really cool. It really is crazy how the world works. Um, yeah. I know this topic. I know we had a lot of fun tonight, but at the same time, this is a very serious topic, and 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 I really hope that we we're able to offer some value to to all the folks that are watching this. Um, I, I will I will say one more thing. I've got this really good quote. So. I was doing some research this afternoon um, after I read all the questions, and I found this quote from, from uh, George Patton. Do not take counsel of your fears. So General Patton, do not take counsel of your fears. And to me, what he, what he meant by that is don't let your fears dictate your actions. Now, that doesn't mean don't prepare. That doesn't mean don't do what you're supposed to do so that you can defend your family. But it reminds you that fear is contagious and optimism is contagious as well. And it's important that, that all, of, all, of, all of us that are, that are watching this right now remember that, that we're all leaders in our own lives. Some of you are leaders of your family. Some of you are leaders at work. Some of you are leaders in your church. And it's so important right now to really lean in to the ultimate test of being a leader which is being a leader in times of hardship. And that is what we have right now, folks. And I know that you can do it. Just remember to focus on your gratitude and lean into that fear, and we are going to get through this. Colion, thanks again. Any other uh, parting comments? Um, so I, I'm going to be starting a podcast here very soon. Would like for you to come and join me on the podcast whenever I get that wherever whenever I get that set up, which will be pretty soon, considering we all relegated to our houses anyway. Um, so yeah, um, you guys look forward to that. The Noir Coleon Noir podcast coming soon. 
And um, of course, if uh, you know, you so will, you know, oh, we're gonna drop in some new merchandise, by the way. We're gonna drop in some I will not comply hats, um, as well as the PP Life camo and black multi cam hats. Um, other than that, I'll be pumping out the videos, get some uh, other projects in the work that I think uh, the guys will really love. Um, so that's about it. Awesome, awesome. Well, th thank you again, Koyon. Um, and for all of you watching, thanks for th taking the time to spend with us tonight. And uh, I wish nothing but safety and security for you and your family. And with that, I'll say from the USCCA, this is Tim Schmidt saying take care and stay safe.